Chapter 2 The Boy with the Lion Eyes For the rest of the day, I kept sneaking glances over my shoulder at the new boy and noticed that everyone else was doing the same. Most of the time he kept his head down low, but every so often I'd catch him staring right back at us. He had the strangest coloured eyes I'd ever seen, like a bright ocean, but on a half sunny, half cloudy day. They were grey and silvery blue with specks of golden brown. They reminded me of a programme I saw about lions once. The camera operator had zoomed into a lion's face so much that its, its eyes had taken up the whole screen. The new boy's eyes were like the lion's eyes. They made you want to never stop staring. When Tom joined our class last year, I stared at him a lot too. I didn't mean to, but I kept imagining that he came from an American spy family, like the ones you see in the movies. He told me later that he thought there was something wrong with me. The new boy probably thought there was something wrong with me too, but it's hard to stop staring at new people, especially when they have eyes like a lion's. We had geography in first period that morning, so we couldn't get up to say hello to the new boy. Then at break time, I looked around the playground for him, but couldn't see him anywhere. In second period, we had PE, but the new boy didn't join in. He just sat in the corner staring at his rucksack, which was red with a black stripe on it, and it looked very dirty. I thought he must have forgotten his PE kit because his bag looked empty and saggy. I tried waving at him, but he never looked up. Not even once. Whenever we do pee, I like to pre pretend that I'm training to join Tintin on an adventure and have to be the super fastest human on the planet. The only problem is my legs aren't as long as I want them to be yet. So even when I jump as hard as I can, I always get stuck in the middle of the vault. Every birthday, I make a wish that I'll grow at least four inches taller and I drink as much milk as I can so that my bones will stretch. But... Even though I'm nine and three quarters now, I've only grown one and a half inches since my last birthday. Or at least, that's what my mum says. I tried my best to jump over the vault in one go in front of the new boy, but I got stuck again. Luckily, he didn't see me because he was staring at his rucksack the whole time. After pee, we had lunch break, and Josie, Tom, Michael and me decided we'd try and find the new boy so that he wasn't all on his own. We waited right next to the playground doors, but the new boy never came out. Tom even went to check the boys' toilets, because that's where he'd tried to hide on the first day when he didn't know anyone, but there was no one there. Maybe he's having lunch with the lower grades by mistake, said Josie. But when we got into the lunch hall, we couldn't see him anywhere. In the afternoon, we had history, and we were split into groups but the new boy was allowed to sit on his own and not join in. Mrs. Kant spent more time with him than she did with any of our groups, and she was pointing at things in a new workbook she had gotten him. Maybe he's deaf, someone whispered. Maybe he can't speak English, muttered someone else. There's definitely something wrong with him, whispered everyone. That afternoon, I don't think any of us learned about what it was like to be a gladiator living in Roman times because we were all too busy whispering about the new boy. He must have known what we were doing because his face was red the whole time. Then, at last break, he disappeared again. He must be inside, said Michael, after we'd finished searching the whole playground for the third time in a row. By now, my lemon sherbets were getting sticky in my pocket and beginning to look like bright yellow fuzzballs. At home time, everyone was still talking about the new boy and wondering who he was. I think it was because a whole day had passed and no one knew anything about him except for his name. Not even Clarissa, and she'd been sitting right next to him. People kept running up to her to ask if the new boy had said anything to her, but she just shook her head and said he was using a lower year workbook, so his reading and writing mustn't be very good. On our way to the bus stop, we saw everyone crowding around Jenny just outside the front gate. Jenny's famous in school for always knowing something about everything, so we ran over to her to hear what she was saying. Jenny's in the class next door and has the longest hair in school. She likes to spy on people and then tell stories about them to other people. 
Sometimes the stories are true, but most of the time they're only half true because she likes making things up. Last year, she told a story about Josie cheating in a football match by pretending to fall down so that she could get a penalty kick. But I was there, and so was Tom, and we both saw her fall down after being kicked in the leg by an upper boy called Robert. She had a big fat bruise on her leg the shape of Australia for weeks afterwards. But no matter how many times we showed everyone the bruise and told them what really happened, no one believed us. Not even the people who were there. Sometimes I think everyone likes to believe a lie, even when they know it's a lie, because it's more exciting than the truth. And they especially like to believe it if it's printed in a newspaper. I know that now. I also know why mum says politicians are liars and always shouts at them whenever they come on telly. Maybe Jenny will be a politician when she grows up. When we got closer, we heard Jenny telling everyone that the new boy had spent all his break times with Mrs Sanders because he'd done something bad in his old school and was too dangerous to be let out into the playground with us. But I didn't believe her. I could, te- I could tell that Michael didn't believe her either because he asked her how she knew so much about it. Jenny got angry and crossed her heart and hoped to die that she had heard Mr Owen talking to Mrs Timms outside the teacher's staff room and that both of them had said how sorry they felt for Mrs. Can, and how glad they were that the new boy wasn't in their class because it wasn't going to be easy to deal with. But before we could ask her any more questions, Jenny's dad began to beep at her from his car, so she ran off. We all watched her go, and then looked back through the school gates to see if the new boy had come out. But we couldn't see him anywhere. He's probably left already, said Josie. Tom and Michael nodded. Let's just wait two more minutes, I said, hoping that he would still be inside. And I was glad I did, because a few seconds later, the new boy came out into the playground. He was holding Mrs. Can's hand and staring at the ground. A woman who was waiting by the door, outdoor benches suddenly shouted, Gooey! and ran over to them. She was wearing a long brown coat, a woolly hat, and a bright red scarf. She stood and talked to Mrs. Can for a long time and nodded an awful lot but we couldn't hear anything because we were standing too far away. I wonder if that's his mum, said Josie. I didn't think so because the new boy didn't hug her at all and seemed shy around her too. Come on, said Michael. He was pointing to his watch, which was beeping like a submarine. Michael has a special watch that tells him when the next bus is coming. It's meant to help him get to places on time, but I've only ever seen it make him bump into things more quickly. No, wait, I said, and before I could think about it too much, I ran over to where the new boy was standing. Hello, I said, tapping him on the shoulder. Mrs. Can and the woman in the red scarf looked down at me as I reached into my pocket and got out the lemon sherbet. Here, I said, holding it out. I was a little bit embarrassed because by now the sherbet was covered in fluff, but it was still good enough to eat. That's the good thing about lemon sherbets, no matter how bad they look. They still always taste delicious. I think I must have spoken too loudly because the new boy took a step away from me as though he was frightened. It's all right, Amit, you can take it, said the woman, motioning to him with her hands as if she was speaking in sign language. But the new boy grabbed her hand and hid his face behind her arm. I didn't know what to do because I've never really scared anyone so much before that they wanted to hide away from me. The woman spoke to him gently again. And after a few seconds, he took the sherbet and looked straight at me with his lion eyes before hiding away again. Thank you, said the woman. She looked at me and gave me a smile. I liked her deep brown eyes because they seemed kind and her bright pink cheeks. But what I liked best of all was how her long blonde hair swirled around in the wind from underneath her hat. Amet will enjoy that on the ride home. I nodded and then ran back to where Josie and Tom and Michael were waiting for me. I felt extra happy because Mrs. Can had smiled at me with her whole face and had given me a wink too, just like my dad used to do whenever he thought I'd done something good or when he was teasing my mum. When I'm a grown-up, I'm going to wink at people just like he used to do and make them feel special too. And as we made our way home, I decided that the next day, whenever I saw the boy staring at me, I was going to give him just as many winks as I could.